we had our first fraud attacks in like August of last year, which is awesome. <laughs> like, you, you know you're in the right place when the fraudsters come. Now, it's a little bit terrifying for a team that hasn't experienced it. But what it means is people understand that there's real velocity that's on the other side. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fintech Leaders, a weekly podcast where we learn from today's global leaders in fintech business and beyond. Coming to you from New York City, I'm your host, Miguel Armasa. If you enjoy this conversation, I encourage you to share it and please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever you get your shows so more people can learn from it. In this episode, I sit down with Peter Hazelhurst, CEO and co-founder of Sinterra, a banking as a service platform powering accounts, cards, payments, lending, and more. Launched back in 2020, Sinterra has raised close to $50 million from FinVC, Lightspeed, Portage, MasterCard, Max Levchin, Alexa Von Tobel, and a long list of great fintech minds. Peter has also built and sold more than one fintech company over the past 30 years and also held leadership roles at Uber, Google, and Yodley. In this episode, we discuss banking as a service, past, present, and future. Where is the industry going and why close attention to compliance is more important than ever? Lessons for fintech builders. Peter launched his first fintech company in the early 90s and has seen it all. What company leaders should keep in mind when building a client onboarding and sales process for fast-growing companies, fraud management, fundraising, reflections, and a lot more. Hope you enjoyed this amazing conversation with Peter from Singterra. Peter. Welcome to New York, first Thank of you. all. It's freezing outside. What the hell happened to the nice weather? You came in one of the coldest days of... It's going to be eight degrees on Friday. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not looking forward to it. But I am very glad that you're here, and I'm very glad that we found the time to do this. Peter, you have a very interesting story because you've been in different parts of fintech for a couple of decades, correct? Three decades. So we have a, a lot to learn from you. and. Some of the highlights, Yodli, Google, Postmates, Uber, and all those one way or another touch fintech, or sometimes they are fintech companies. So maybe let's start there. Tell us a, a bit about your experience in, in this companies that I imagine when you joined were not as big as, as we see them today, and then you were part of that growth story. Yeah. I mean... Look, so I came to the US when I was 20 to do my first startup. And we were crazy people that didn't understand building core banking system was supposed to be hard. And so we built the first one on Windows back in 93. And because you don't know anything, all the things that would say, don't do it, didn't make any sense. And we didn't know anything, so we just built it. And we were really, really lucky. Like, I don't know, it's super rare you have that experience where it just works. But we grew, we got a bunch of banks running on our platform. We grew, we went public in 96, which like those days going public was a hard thing. It wasn't anywhere near like what it is today in terms of flexibility. And we did it from Orlando of all places. Orlando. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, I mean, it was pre 9-11, so flights were relatively easy and it was a good place to live from that perspective. But we built a bunch of banking stuff. We built core banking systems. And then we went global, which was kind of fun. So I spun up a team in Santiago, Chile with Unisys. We spun up teams in Europe and in Africa and in Australia with Siemens Nixdorf. And suddenly there was this sort of global tentacles of four banking systems going around the world. Then I was crazy and did a dot-com. Zero to 180 employees back to zero in like 11 months or something. It was amazing experience, but like it's hard to shut stuff down. I'm glad we ended up in a good spot of ending, finding jobs for most people, which after .com was quite challenging. But we built an online accounting system, Think QuickBooks. And it was great. It was fantastic. We had people paying us money to use it in 99 on the web. 
And so then I, I just got the, the bug and moved up to DC, did a supply chain company. Then we did a mobile email company that we sold to Nokia. And so that was really fun working in a, a massive company. I'd never done a big company before. And Nokia at the time was huge. All the phones were Nokia. I, I had Nokia phones. It was half of every phone store in the world. Like, so imagine this 98 SKUs or 96 SKUs. One chunk is Nokia, and then there was two Samsungs and an original Sony or something like that, and a whole bunch of crappy Eric's and so on. And it was such a beautiful product company, and it changed my perspective. So I started as, I'll call myself a coder, not an engineer, because I didn't go to school for college or anything. But anyway, so we built some banking stuff. Then I came and worked for Yodli, and Yodli was the sort of creator of account verification. We had all the patents around PFM and so on. And Yodli was fun. Like we flipped that business around. When I started, it was quite a small engine team, about 30-ish people. When I left, it was about six, 700 people in product and tech and operations and everything. And we brought in from effectively account per aggregation for high net worth individuals. So our first customer was Citibank. And this was right after in like 99, 2000 when Glass-Steagall fell. And so Citi bought Lehman's and Solomon Smith Barney. And they also bought the insurance company Travelers. And Citi customers wanted a screen to see what they had and no one at Citi could build it. So we actually did internal scraping of Citi properties to create the Citi One dashboard. So that was the start of the Yodley experience. Then we pivoted or expanded it to add online personal finance. So we launched the equivalent of Quicken or Microsoft Money. That launched with Bank of America in, I want to say, November of 2006. And then usage went off the charts. So Yodley was a really interesting experience. All of the customers were the really big banks. It was very different from community banks. So imagine a community bank in Mason City, Iowa with one branch or Bank of America with 10,000 branches or I don't even know how many branches they have. And so you had procurement and all these processes that don't seem to do anything with fintech, but you have to learn them anyway. Then I went to Google and worked on Google Wallet and pay by Gmail and so on. And we had an amazing team that launched Tap and Pay, which was pretty cool. We bought a company here in New York called TX Beer, which is where I met Jonathan Weiner and Anil. And we basically built a payment processor inside Google so that we could be the first version of tokenization. You had a card that you'd added for Google Play to buy something online. We actually minted a Discover card in your phone. So when you tapped and paid, it went to Discover, it came back to us. We then e-commerce authorized it. So we lost, I don't know, a percent on every transaction. But we weren't doing it for rev share. It wasn't an interchange play, it was an ads play. And being able to say, I saw this ad online and you went to this store and we could prove Connect it. it. Which in those days was the holy grail. And it's still the holy grail. So Google is an amazing advertiser for digital. And why people use Google ads is because you can prove I saw this ad, I went to that page, I did that click through, but no one could do it online to offline. And that was what we were trying to build. Google was fun. Last big gig was running payments and risk at, at Uber, which was really complicated. Lots of countries, 70 countries, wallets everywhere, checking accounts everywhere, payment methods up the wazoo. And we built almost everything in house, which was really great. And part of that was launching Uber Money, which was a neo bank for drivers. And that really then yielded, why did we start Singtera, which was this idea that there are going to be lots of other companies that want to do the next Uber money of the world, but they don't have all the resources. So we had lots of engineers, we had BD people, lawyers, everything that a company would want in order to be able to work with all the providers like Mark Hedder and so forth. And no one else does. So Singtera basically is this idea of do all that heavy lifting on the relationship side, normalize all the APIs publish to builders a standard package of how to build your fintech, whether it's a, a neobank for people that love their pets, or if it's a, a bank to help web developers based in Mexico get paid easily in the US, all different sorts of use cases, but we simplify all of that. And then on the other side, we actually work with community banks again, so it's back to the future for me, working with the most early customers from the 90s and helping them become sponsor banks. Because right now, even though there are more and more sponsor banks participating, there's still a supply imbalance. And what we try to do is help look at what's this fintech trying to do, match make them to the right sort of bank based on their risk profile, and then help them work together. So that's what we do. Yeah, no, that's exciting. And, and 
there's, I guess, always that tension of building in house like you did at Uber. Yeah. Or working with a provider. Where is that right balance? Who's the right customer for Singtera? I would say that the ideal customer for us is someone who knows they need some sort of banking service, probably technical. They build stuff themselves that don't know how to do banking. And so where we help is we understand KYC, we understand fraud, we understand the rules and the things you have to do, whether you want to or not. We understand compliance. And most people building don't have that. At Uber, we were lucky we had a huge compliance team that had thought about this. And, you know, we trained ourselves by launching an e-money institution in Europe. So, like, that's high-level compliance. And everybody was inspecting Uber, so we didn't have a choice. Most fintechs come to us and they say, I really want to pay my workers faster. Or I think that I could create an ecosystem between my suppliers and my customers if I had banking as a glue. Can you help me do that? And so they usually have their own business doing something, and now we help extend it. For example, we have this great fintech run by Ty called Players Help. And Ty's vision is to help kids do sports. And it's a beautiful vision because when kids do sports, they are healthier. It's pretty straightforward. But there's so many things that get in the way of doing that conveniently. So imagine you're a parent and your kid's playing football. You're staring at three to 500 bucks worth of uniforms and equipment every year because kids grow like weeds. And so you got 500 bucks of outlay. You probably have to pay 250 bucks or 500 bucks to join the club. And that's before you start playing. And many parents want their kids to play, but can't make it because they can't pay the thousand bucks up front. So Ty's got this great model of play now, pay later, which I think is really engaging for the parents. Mm -hmm. And then there's the second order of the banking problem, which is let's say you're the coach and all these parents give you a thousand bucks. What do you do with the money? Because if you put it in your own checking account, the IRS will say, hey, is that income? Yeah. And it's not your real money. It's really the trust money. So we've also worked with them on how to bank that money on behalf of the clubs as well. And so what's nice about what we're doing and what's fun about Cintera is all these really disparate use cases that are coming to market and figuring out how to solve the problem together. One thing I noticed about your profile is that you are actually, you worked on Libra. Facebook's. I did. I think in my last 210 interviews, that topic has not come up. So <laughs> I, I, you know, why did it fail? Did it fail? I think it did, right? It Definitely. Definitely. Um, so what happened? So David Marcus is a good friend and, and reached out and said, hey, Peter, I'm doing this blockchain thing. And I was just like, oh, I hate blockchain. I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> He's like, no, no, it's good blockchain. And I was like, all right, let's give it a chat. And so we had this good chat. And the fundamental premise of a truly stable coin that's stabilized by five or six currencies and mark to market revaluation. In my head, I was like, yeah, that sounds right. It sounds like the EU basketization that happened with the confirmation to the euro, for example. Because theoretically, there was Spanish lira. I don't know what's main we had. Pesetas. Pesetas yeah. at the time, pesos and so forth. So there were ultimate other currencies that folded in. I was like, yeah, that sounds reasonable. And if Facebook at the time could end up as an endpoint for money for our driver community, this would be great. So we would pay the driver. They could convert their money into Libra for free. We didn't charge them anything. And that Libra dollars or Libra bucks could be transferred through Facebook to mum and dad in Brazil or Mexico or Italy or France for free and in real time. Perfect. Use case, absolutely aligned a free and inexpensive way to transfer money, fantastic. I think some of the challenges were trying to work with a disparate community where some of the community represented super displaced people, for example, and they don't have identity. They don't have KYC documents. They don't have any of that stuff. And how can you trustfully bring them into the ecosystem? And I think what we were trying to do was probably too ambitious in the sense of saying, we can solve identity, we can solve money movement and all these things when if we'd stuck really closely to it's a payment method it'll help you move money globally and no we're not trying to take over the central currencies of the world which no one ever was but you could understand some people being a little bit worried about it i think that made it a big challenge notwithstanding at the time unfortunately facebook was going through a bunch of stuff which didn't help yeah and i guess that experience also informs your view today 
of navigating a regulated environment, right? Yeah, I think th for me, we've always, so at Uber, we were the part of Uber that were sort of volunteered to be regulated, which was a relatively new concept. And the problem or the interesting part about payments and banking is there's literally a person with a switch. And if you don't play nice, the person turns the switch and you're turned off. And it's not actually that complicated at switch. And there's actually multiple places. Someone at the Fed can do it. Someone at MasterCard or Visa can do it. Someone at the bank can do it. And generally the rules go like this. We have a set of ways we expect you to operate. We call them compliance rules. Operate within those boxes. Great. Make mistakes. Also great, provided you were intentionally doing the right thing. When people start to get in trouble with all of this regulated world is where they think the rules don't apply to them or that they can be cute in the interpretation of the rules. And invariably, we've seen this time and time again in banking. The people that are flirting with the rules may have really high-flying economic results in the short term, but eventually the compliance catches up to them. And so I think of compliance much more as a strategic asset in the sense of go in there, do it the right way, and that will inform and ensure that you actually get the best outcome. Asking for forgiveness from a regulator isn't a plan. Yeah, it's not feasible in fintech. Yeah. Let's talk about that because BAS, banking as a service, has been a lot in, in the in the headlines and the news. Regulators are, are looking at it. And of course, not every company, not every case is, is made equal. But, you know, this is right in the center of where you are. Yeah. You know, maybe tell us a little bit of what's going on and, you know, why are regulators paying attention and... So with the passing of the Durban bill in 2008 and then the enactment in 2011, you suddenly had this arbitrage opportunity, which was if you were a non-bank entity, you could run a viable, arguably viable business sharing interchange with the sponsor bank. And the interchange was premised on in round numbers, 140 bips for a checking account for a consumer, 240 bips for a commercial account. And so what you then discovered is a whole bunch of smart people coming and say, well, I'm really good at marketing. I'm really good at brand. I have a community. What if I launch a bank like thing? We won't call it a bank because if we call it a bank, we get in trouble and see what happens. And so in the earliest of days, you saw this transition from PayPal going from closed loop to open loop and just started issuing a debit card because they wanted you to spend. We at Google launched Google Wallet, which was powered by the time Bancorp, I believe. And, and we were the big guys. We had lots of resources. We could do it. But it was hard, right? Doing payment processing yourself was painful. There weren't the Galileos or the Marquettes of the world at the time. So you're basically signing up to build a connection to the internet and to build a connection to Visa or MasterCard. Fast forward five, six years later, and you get the early folks like Synapse starting saying, hey, we can do the heavy tech lift. Bank, you're still responsible. We'll do the tech lift. Now we can expose more builders to the concept because you don't have to have as much resources. Fast forward to today, and there are companies like ours that have really made it quite easy for a fintech to build. Uh, you know, a record time to market is six weeks. I don't think it'll go much faster than that in the near term, but six weeks is pretty good to issuing a debit card and doing a swipe. Yeah, I, I, I know companies are, they've done it in 18 months. Yeah, right. well, it was 12 months at Uber and yeah. 12 months at Google. These are hard projects. Yeah. So we've shrunk that time down. Where the regulators need to help the sponsor banks is most of the sponsor banks in general are quite small. So maybe they're five branches, 10 branches. And so the bank bank itself Maybe it has 25,000 customers, 50,000, 10,000 credit customers on mortgages and stuff like that. And along comes the fintech and they're getting 25,000 customers a week. So all of the processes and experiences that the bank would have had for the branch operations don't work anymore. Because imagine you walk into a branch and say, hey, I'd like a checking account, please. They're like, show me your driver's license. Do you have like a bank statement or... Do you have, you know, a Verizon bill? And you do all that in-person dynamic. You can't do that 25,000 people a week or 100,000 or a million. And so we've now created digital equivalents of those services. 
And the question is, how reliable are they? And how easy is it to cheat them? And can you actually rely on a selfie check and maybe hold your ID up next to your face type of stuff? And if you can, great, because now you can go faster. But the onus is on the bank to prove that the fintech is doing it correctly. So the bank can't just say it's the fintech's problem because it's not. Fundamentally, the account is a bank account. And so legally, they have this imperative. And what the regulators are trying to help frame up is, what's the right process to do that oversight? At Singtera, we do a lot of help for our bank partners of creating infrastructure, so dashboards where they can say, how many people have you looked at? And then the second order of this is, well, what about fraud? You know, is it going to be really bad for the bank if there's a whole bunch of fraud in this fintech? So nobody wants fraud in general, but fraud exists. So first job is to try and stamp out as much as you can. But if you kill all fraud, then there's no business. I mean, we could have had a riskless business at Uber, but no one would have got a car, picked them up. It would have never happened. So thinking about that, the regulators are coming in and saying, okay, we want you to monitor and observe what's happening in your fintechs. We want you to take reserves against them doing something that gets them in trouble. So you'll see most banks will say, we need you put 25 grand or 100 grand in a reserve account so that when fraud happens, because fintech, you own the losses, we're going to pull it out of the reserve so the bank is whole in real time, and then you can figure out your own stuff along the way. And so the game with fintech is always try and keep your reserve as low as possible because you don't want to leave that cash sitting still while making the bank comfortable that if everything really goes bad, you're still going to be a whole. And it's that game of risk management, which is banking generally, right? Right. There's a reason why, you know, we put ATM machines tied to walls and we don't sit them in the middle of the road and say, please come and attack me. But digitally doing that is not normal for most of the banks. Most of the community banks we work with don't have a huge digital presence. And suddenly now they're exposed to all this consumers that they don't really know like humanly. And so bringing that human connection to the digital experience is something that we're really trying to help. Tell us a bit about the company. How big is it? You've been around for three years, is it? Two and a half years going to take. Yeah. Yeah. So we're still quite early. So technically we started in September of 2020. So it was one of these crazy things that was starting in during COVID and all my work experience prior to pandemic was in-person experiences, right? And so Google was a super in-person company. Google's a super in-person company. And that's all we knew. And so here we are starting this company, me, Chris, and Dominic. And I'd never met them before. <laughs> and I was like, this is too weird. I, so we said, where's the least covid place we could find? And we flew to Boulder. And we were in a WeWork. And it was one of these weird things where like, <laughs> they had little stickers saying where you were allowed to sit on the WeWork table. Yeah. And there were whole monitors coming around saying, too close. <laughs> Step back. <laughs> and we were wearing masks all the time. I mean, it was like, it was awesome that we could actually meet. Because I was like, I can't do this if we'd never met before in person. And then we had dinner together. And at dinner, we just felt sit, effort, take the mask. <laughs> I mean, do you remember in the days, like, you had to use, go like this and eat? And be- I always thought that was very ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> your audience, that was me attempting to visualize taking my mask down and putting a spoon of food in my mouth. Yeah, But it was such a different experience to start a company that like that. We were really lucky. We had a great team. And so when we went to raise our seed round, it was great. And Lightspeed ended up leading, which was really fab. And they've been great supporters. And very quickly, even though we hadn't finished build, we hadn't built very much yet. We we're starting to get all my fintech friends saying, hey, Peter, is it ready? Yet? Is it ready? Yet? Is it ready? Yet? Mm-hmm. Like, no, come back in a year. And then we started to get all of the banks saying, we want this too. So we had this really strong inbound signal. We weren't selling. We were just like building. And then along Logan came at Fin Capital, Fin VC, and led a Series A, which was really great, and gave us the the resources to get us to launch. And launch was effectively a year later. So money 2020 in 21. And that was great. We told everyone we existed. We had a bunch of folks at a pretty fun party. Yeah, yeah and I remember that party. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, caused a bit of a ruckus with that, and that was good. And that was put us on the map. So then 2022, last year, was all about getting those first 10, 15 fintechs up and running, 
and it's you know it's startup life so many of them were early and half of them died before they even got to launch which is welcome to their challenge and that was q1 q2 we started to ramp up we actually raised prices we were like seems like people like what we do so we'll actually charge fees what a novel concept and that went really well we signed four or five big deals in q2 q3 was awesome we were super lucky it was Everything, like in the space of six months, we went from pre-seed and seed funded startups to series D and E startups. Hmm. So like everything changes. So, you know, we were like, would you sign a one-year contract, you know, without early customers? And now they're like, we only want to do three-year deals. And we're like, how do we commit to a three-year deal? <laughs> and so like the business dynamically moved really quickly. Yeah. Q4 was also quite strong for us. And basically we've created a lot of momentum, which is really good. Now where we are is in this phase, which is quite challenging, which is you've signed a bunch of deals. All of them are implementing and starting to build. And every one of them finds something unique because our API is really, really wide and it's imperfect, right? By design, we've co-developed a lot of the APIs with our customers. The challenge for that is like along comes customer two that's similar to customer one, but not quite exactly the same. And they ask for something slightly different. So we've been quite reactive. The engine tech teams have done a really great job of adapting to our customers. And this year is all about getting those 20, 30 fintechs live this quarter. So it's really busy. Like there's a whole bunch of people running around kind of crazy right now. And just everything breaking and rechesting, right? So like the payment gateway, you know, if it gets hammered with a million transactions, is it okay? Well, it turns out, yeah, million's good, million and a half, not so good. And so we, we had a little bit of like mad scramble over the weekend fixing a bug. But this is fun. This is great. We had our first fraud attacks in like August of last year, which is awesome. <laughs> like, you know, you're in the right place when the fraudsters come. Now, it's a little bit terrifying for a team that hasn't experienced it. But what it means is people understand that there's real velocity that's on the other side. And I don't know, we had $80,000, $90,000 of exposure and we settled it down for like 200 bucks. So the team rallied. Everyone's like in a war room, like, oh my God, the world's <laughs> coming to an end. I'm like, look, this is good. This is great. And they're like, it doesn't feel good. And I'm like, it's okay. I promise we'll get through it. So we're in that phase right now where it's super operational product teams are coming together. And now it's the next level of perfection, like making the dashboards easier to understand. We have all the data, but you know, I can't see revenue as easily as I'd like fixing reconciliation, billing, all those sorts of things. One of my recent guests was Bargeron from Balance. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about this concept that you just mentioned, which is it's probably ideal to start with pre-seed, seed type of companies and slowly graduate to larger ones. Mm -hmm. Looks sounds like for you, it wasn't that slowly and that can come with its own challenges because large companies have large requests. Yeah. Right. They have like <laughs> public companies have procurement. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And you're like RFPs. And my team got our first RFP and they're like, what do we do with this? I'm like, you answer every question and there's like, I don't know, a thousand questions. So for the founders, the entrepreneurs tuning in, that are about to go through that process or actually in the works internally, how do you structure your team to be ready to onboard continuously larger and larger clients? I wish there was a magic playbook. I think it's different by different teams. What I will say has worked for us is thinking about the supply chain of the process, right? So we had an open door, come to our APIs, start coding. We opened that door really wide when we launched T10, which is live testing. So you can actually print a real debit card, you can do small transactions. And we don't really talk to you, it's kind of like Brex for a Pintex. And you literally onboard, you do KYC and KYB as the founder. And we kind of watch and make sure you don't do anything completely crazy. But we're letting within the sort of safe confines of the network, you can try real things. And so what we use is that as signal data of, is this FinTech working? And it's really interesting. The really big FinTechs also use the playground. Mm. It's not just the early guys. So, which is not obvious. My intuition was that it was just going to be the people that couldn't afford to get started. But it's actually the big teams who don't want to wait for their procurement team. So they just start building anyway, which is really both interesting and good. I think what works well is thinking about how much time does it take from the time you first talk to the customer to the time they go live and then breaking down where the gaps of time are. For the early stage ones, it's not contracts. For the early stage ones, it's like, oh, I'll sign anything kind of thing. As they get more mature, the contracting phase becomes quite complicated. Mm -hmm. And so you then need to invest more in 
your own contracts lawyer. And I was resistant. I was like, oh, do we need a lawyer? And everyone's like, hey, do we need a contracts lawyer? And I was like, fine. And we hired this guy, Sri Raj, who's amazing. And I don't know what life was like before him. I think he just hit a year, but it's so good now. So it's actually a good expense. Then you need to start thinking about the supply chain of deal flow upfront. So do you need your first SDR to sort of peel off the deals and qualify them a little bit? That comes through. Then it's all about implementation speed. And implementation speed is indexed based on how good's your documentation, how much sample code do you have, and does it actually do what it says it's going to do? Because there's nothing worse than the documentation saying, please put in first name, last name, middle initial. And then you can't actually put a middle initial in there. And you're like, oh, sorry, the API is broken. And why it's really important in my mind to start with the smaller startups first is because they're more tolerant. They know they're, they're like you on the other side and they'll work with you when you discover the edgy stuff in your platform. And you want to learn from them as quickly as you can. We were super lucky. That cycle was really, really fast. I was expecting it probably to take two quarters, maybe three. And for us, it was a quarter and then we're into the deep end. But the downside of going fast and getting to bigger customers is everything gets pushed harder and their expectations are raised. And if they're paying 10 grand a month in minimums, they don't want to lose their $10,000 because things couldn't launch on time. So the last bit that becomes most important is, do you know how to actually launch the customer? And in fintech, that means, have you got your bank sign off? Does the bank actually understand all the use case? Have you tested all the policies? Have you got all the documentation right? Did you get MasterCard to approve the design of your debit or credit card? And there's so many checklists. It's kind of funny. I was like, well, can't we just make a simple checklist? And we did. And it was like a thousand lines long. I was like, hmm, cool. <laughs> I guess we need checklists for checklists. And that becomes a pipeline. The end state for us is actually much more like Shopify for banking, where all of that is constrained. And you can launch a near bank quite easily, but it can only do a certain feature set. And if you want to step outside that boundary, just like Shopify, there's the APIs, you can do the deep extensions. But then we get this feature set of simple and convenient, get signal, and then evolve into it. And so, I don't know, for founders like us, getting alignment with your first customers is probably the most valuable thing because they will tell the other ones whether you want them to or not. Mm -hmm. The whole background, the ref check is not what you think it is. So just because you said, hey, talk to these guys, doesn't mean that the new customer isn't going to talk to every other one. Yeah. And even if it doesn't work out and the fintech decides to do something else or whatever, it's more about how you engage. And as long as you're sincerely saying, I want you to win, then everything's good. Where it gets ugly is when you've got a customer you don't really like or something mm. and you're not supporting them evenly or equally. And that becomes a challenge. So reputation in this business is really important. So banking as a service, lending as a service, that has been your core so far. What's down the line? I, maybe you, you can't share all your strategy, but you know, give us a, a sneak peek of you know, the plans for the future of Singter. So I think there's a couple of things that are, we're seeing in the system, which is really interesting. So we're seeing a lot of interest in Canvas. So we have one bank, uh, Regent Bank in Oklahoma, that is comfortable doing Canvas banking. So that's quite interesting. And there's lots of unique constraints. There's tons more compliance. There's cash, like cash collections and things like that that you have to solve for the dispensaries. So that's one universe of problem. And we've invested a bunch to support folks in that category. I think there's going to be a lot of interest in that second and third product for each of the near banks. So most of the near banks started with a wallet, a checking account, a savings account, something like that. The more advanced ones have started to add some form of lending, whether it's as simple as $50 overdraft or as complicated as a line of credit that you can dip into and so on. Now people are starting to launch charge cards. So we, we just signed our first charge card customer, which is really exciting. I think they're launching in May. And that then sort of couples the benefits of credit with the safety of debit for effectiveness. So lending, I think, is going to be a big growth area for many fintechs. The, the related part of that is investing. Personally, I don't think anyone should trade stocks individually. I think it's crazy. Like if you think you can outsmart the guys down here at Goldman Sachs, you're on crack. There's like no way. And they, and they just sit there waiting for like the, the individual 100 share order of Apple thinking, which block trade am I going to sell that against? So consumers shouldn't do that. 
But I do think there's something to be said for ETFs or end stake funds where you say, I want to retire at 65 like Vanguard does. And making that easy for consumers or businesses to get to woven into their online banking experience, I think is really important. And there's great companies like Drive Wealth and others that allow that sort of embedding. And I think we're going to see a lot of that in our next phase because the fintechs, the next chimes of the world are not saying I'm going to live on interchange. They're thinking about the comprehensive relationship, just like all banking. The reality is checking accounts at B of A and others are effectively loss leaders to get you to get a loan or a mortgage or a credit card or something else. And what the communities that we're supporting are realizing is they need those other products too. Fascinating stuff. Peter, as I've mentioned, a lot of the audience and when I'm recording, I think of entrepreneurs. Those are the ones tuning in, you know, for founders building right now in the challenging, especially capital markets environment, you've been through multiple cycles. Mm -hmm. you know, what would you tell founders that are in that process of, you know, getting started early and who are maybe, you know, struggling through this process? So let's start with the category in general. So in times when there's economic turbulence, it's very clear to me that fintech and technology to help people manage their money is actually top of mind for everybody. When you don't have as much as you wish you needed, managing those dollars to be most effective, spending it wiser, earning better rewards, getting the best interest rate on a loan, those things are actually really important. And so if you look at the phases of innovation, there was a whole chunk of innovation that happened after 2001, after dot-com, in general purpose tech. FinTech innovation literally happened after 2008, and tons of great, interesting companies got created at that time. And what I'm seeing right now is a bunch of really creative people coming to market right now. So great ideas are still getting funded, for sure. Are the crazy valuations of 2021 and stuff like that happening? No. But if you've got a great idea and a great team, there are great investors sitting on the sidelines waiting to pounce on you and give you the support you need to grow. I would say to the folks that are struggling, hang in there. It is actually flipping. You're starting to see the deals coming. I don't know if you guys saw Wade's announcement yesterday or the day before. That was fantastic. Really happy for Wade and the Move team. And there is a bunch of deals that I know that are in flight that are in that same category. So I think it's moving back into, I mean, it's not as crazy as it was, but it's definitely deals are happening, especially deals where there's actually a fundamental business. If you're just saying, I'm, I want to be the next chime, I don't think anyone will support you with that. But if you say, I have this community of 50,000 hardcore PlayStation 5 gamers, and we want to launch a near bank for PlayStation users with reward points and stuff like that, pretty sure Sony would be in on that, as would a whole bunch of investors, because they understand what we can do with banking is what credit unions did in the 50s and 60s. But we're doing it digitally, not physically. So credit unions were aggregations of workers, so like the Boeing credit union or the military credit union, that sort of stuff, or they were geographic bound. There are no geographic boundaries or there are less geographic boundaries online. And so what the definition of community has morphed, but the need is the same. Amazing. Well, Peter, thank you for joining us. Uh, My pleasure. This has been a great lesson of fintech entrepreneurship and I think just entrepreneurship in general. Awesome. Lovely to talk to you and hopefully there's some nuggets that'll help folks. No doubt. Thank awesome. you, Peter. Thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed this great episode with legendary Peter, CEO of Singterra. If you want more interviews, make sure to subscribe, follow and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whenever you get your shows so more people can learn from them. It helps and means a lot. And if you have any suggestions or thoughts about the show, please just drop me a line on Twitter or LinkedIn. Signing off till next week, I'm your host, Miguel Armasa.